God bless you. John 17 this evening for a few moments together before we go into our prayer time. And I've enjoyed studying this, this chapter in God's Word. And my only regret, regret is that I didn't try to do it much earlier. <laughs> uh, I tell you what, I've fallen in love with the chapter and we're trying to uh, mine all that God has for us there as we look at it together. I'm going to read the entire chapter to you again. There's much benefit in reading God's Word. Much benefit. And we ought to read it more out loud. In fact, I think I said a few weeks ago, one of the meetings, we need, we need to pray about doing more of that just in our public worship services. Not to preach a sermon from or not to share a devotion from, just to read the Word of God out loud. Um, it may seem a little too liturgical for some people, like uh, maybe it's too formal, but it's God's Word. <laughs> it's God's Word, and uh, some churches do that where they read the text that will be preached from. I don't know that we have to do that, but I'm praying about, about doing all that as I remember it. But let's read this chapter together again, and I'll begin reading there in verse 1 if you'll follow along with me. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, and thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known, all, known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they, may, that they all may be one, as thou, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may, they, they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. And a wonderful passage, and we can't read it too often. Thank God for the truth that's expressed here all the way through God's word. But we're trying to take our emphasis for a few moments tonight in verses 14 through 18. We're together on Sunday morning. By the way, I want to say publicly again, I certainly enjoyed Brother Mike Went preaching on Sunday night. He did a fine job sharing God's word. And uh, we're praying for Brother Mike. He was gonna, his knee will get better, but he did a wonderful job handling the Word of God, didn't he? And he certainly challenged and encouraged all of us. Thank the Lord for it. I was helped by all of that. Uh, but as we came together, if we can move be back beyond that just a little bit, I was able to preach on Sunday morning from John 17. And we looked at what God was doing here. The Lord Jesus Christ, excuse me, as he speaks to God the Father very directly, he started to get very specific about the needs of, of his disciples. He knew these fellows. He knew what they needed. By the way, the things that they needed are the things that we need as well. And uh, there's no doubt about that. When we get over uh, to verse 20, we'll begin looking at 
how these things really apply to us. We're making some general applications. But in verse 20, when the Lord allows us to get there, we'll see some more specific things for us, especially. We're making an application in, in an applicational way from these verses now. We get into verse 20 through the end, it's going to be interpretational because God's talking to us directly in the New Testament there. It's interesting to think about that. But on Sunday morning, we said as Jesus began to pray, he had his, he had his prayer list out. He went to the Father. Imagine being able to look at Jesus' prayer list. If he had a handwritten prayer list and what that would look like and what it would be like, you think whatever he's praying for must be pretty important. It must be, must be exactly what they need. And the very first thing on the list, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid to even ask if you would remember what that would be from Sunday morning. Would anybody remember what the very first thing Jesus prayed for? <clears throat> that would be one. Yeah, very good. Is that what you were going to say, Matthew? Same answer as what you said, yeah. As he winks at me. Yes, that was the, he was the same answer. Absolutely. Attila, you were going to say the same thing, correct? Yes. All these men get an A plus on their answer. That they would have solidarity or unity. The number one prayer request, Jesus prayed for the men. Now, by the way, think for a moment what these men would go through in life. Can you think of one thing? Let's just turn into a classroom for a moment. Can you think of one of these men and maybe something that they dealt with in life? Uh, think about Peter. Think about, think about James. Think about, do you know, you can it's, it's okay, we're in church, but I'm going to give you permission to say something out loud. Ooh, ooh, prison. The prison. How about that? Jesus didn't say help them when they go to prison. What's something else that they dealt with? They were stoned. Martyrs, they all, they, they, we went through in one of the messages a Sunday or two ago, talk about the martyrs, the type of martyr's death that they died. Remember Peter especially. Remember he was crucified. But what was unique about Peter's crucifixion? Yes, ma'am. He was upside down. He was crucified upside down. Why would he do something crazy like that? Yes, ma'am. He didn't want to be, uh, he didn't think he was worthy to be killed the same way as Jesus was. Exactly right. He didn't count himself worthy to die in the same manner. Jesus knew Peter would be crucified upside down, but he didn't pray about that. It challenges my heart. Now, sometimes I get in a little trouble but for, with, with some folks. Sometimes I get in a lot of trouble with a lot of folks, a lot of times actually, about a lot of things, but that's another story altogether. And we're not even at my house, so that doesn't really apply here. That's a different story, right? One of the things I get chastised about is trying to put, put a hold on prayer requests for a little while. Prayer requests take on a life of their own. I'm, talk, I'm in a prayer meeting and I'm saying, wait on the prayer requests. We get so quick to move in on the temporal needs. See, Jesus knew what was going to happen to these men. They know Peter was going to deny him. Now, he, he talked to Peter there in Luke, in Luke 22. We dealt with that a few weeks ago. He said, but I have prayed for thee. You know, the, the, your, your faith is going to fail, but it's going to be all right. You're going to have a bright future. I've prayed for you. You're going to deny me. Jesus prayed for them in this way. But in this moment, as he's with these men at the very end, he wasn't talking about their physical, the physical challenges that they would face. His number one prayer request for them was unity and solidarity. How about that? I mean, if we're going to pray like Jesus prays, we have, we have to take note. This truly is the Lord's prayer. We think about the model prayer, and, and it's called the Lord's Prayer. But this, this high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ is truly the Lord's Prayer. And his number one prayer request for them was unity, that they might be, they might be one as we are. And that's a tall order, isn't it? We think about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He was, that was a tall order. No, no reason he was praying. No doubt that's difficult for us. No reason. No wonder he was praying for that to happen. But the number one request was for unity. That the men, those men that he'd been working with for three and a half years, and they needed a lot of help, they'd have unity. Then he prayed for their security, that you would keep them. And he said this, while I was keeping them, none of them is lost, and now they're to be kept through thy name. He prayed for their security, that God would keep and watch over them. And we went back to John chapter 10 and rehearsed the truth that we know to be eternal salvation. Some people call it eternal security. I prefer to call it eternal salvation. That's what the Bible says about it. And that, that means that we, no man can pluck us out of his hand. So we're at the end of, of John 10. And we, we're, we're, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have to worry about our salvation being extinguished or losing. How, how ridiculous to think about losing an eternal possession. You cannot. Why? Because the work was finished on the cross. He said, he prayed for their security. And I'm, I'm glad that Jesus did pray for their satisfaction. He prayed that my joy, my, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And certainly as we serve the Lord and we labor for the Lord and we're soldiers in the army of God and we have a serious work to do and we get, we're working and fighting against the wiles of Satan, he says, I want them to have joy in the midst of all of it. 
And we're reminded of what was said of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews as he went to the cross. It says, for the joy that was set before him. Imagine going to the cross with joy and going to the cross with omniscience about what was going to happen and yet still going with joy. Where's your joy? Jesus' joy is to be fulfilled in us. can be fulfilled. You say, I don't know where my joy is at. I know one thing. Jesus is praying for you to have it. And if Jesus is praying for you and me to have it, where is it? Where is it? I think it's right at the intersection of where our, where, our, where our faith meets our circumstances. And we either get down here or we look up there and look to the Lord. Sometimes our joy jumps out of the window where, where our faith and our circumstances intersect. And whatever those circumstances are, Jesus is praying for our joy. Well, that was just a little synopsis of what we did on the Lord's Day. And Jesus is very specific. I think it's interesting. These are not uncommon themes. They're very common themes. But what raises the level for me in my mind as a Christian is that these are the things that Jesus prayed before he left these men. When he knew he was going to be away and they were going to be on their own, he started praying for their unity, he started praying for their security, he started praying for their satisfaction. And then we get into verses 14 here, and it says here in verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. In verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. He started praying concerning their separation. You know, when you came to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you had a new birth in Christ. You, all of a sudden, my friend, were different than you were before. If any man be in Christ, he is a what, a class? A new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Amen. New creature. Now, I'm glad we exchange our robes for his. I get a whole new set of clothes when I came to Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Those, thank the Lord, those clothes, I don't have to worry about outgrowing so much like I do some of the clothes here on earth. Yeah. Those robes are eternal robes given to me by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so certainly I'm a new creature, but it changes who I am. And, and we are to be distinct from the world as Jesus was distinct from the world. Do you think people took notice of the difference that Jesus Christ made when he walked through the streets of Jerusalem or Galilee or Nazareth? Did he look like a lot of other people? He, did he, did he have to speak the same language as a lot of other people? Yeah, he, he would speak the Aramaic or, the, or whatever the case may be, the Hebrew tongue, wherever he might have been. And he would, he would look like a Jewish man in his 30s. But he was in the world, but not of the world. He was distinct. He's praised and he said the world hates them. What is the world, by the way? First John chapter 2 and verse 16 helps us to understand what the world is. We like to put a lot of definitions on it. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride. That's what the world is. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. What is the world? It's the system that's built around our secular society. That's the, it's the system that prompts us to say, I need more, 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 more. It's materialism. It's humanism. It's the world. It's a secular view. It's a system that provides temptation to you and me. The world provides a service. It tempts us. We don't have to even pay for the service. They offered up for free. What's the world? Jesus is praying about their separation from the world. And friend, if you and I are in Christ, we can, we'll talk about it in a moment. We'll talk about sanctification, but uh, certainly there ought, to be, there ought to be a difference in our life. He prays his disciples will be kept from the influence of the world and of the devil. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 is one verse we probably know pretty well. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, unclean thing, and I will receive you. You say, that sounds like a, a verse out of the Old Testament. Well, Jesus put it in the New Testament. It's in the New Covenant. Christians are different than sinners. Excuse me, are lost folks, because we're all sinners. But, you know, it's one thing that has taken place, and it, it's always been this way. I just think we notice it more because the information is more available. But so many people would call themselves a Christian, and I'm not, thank God I'm not judging them because I would take care of the judgment now and get on with it. God has a lot more grace. By the way, I'm glad folks aren't judging me because they would have taken care of me and gotten on with it. But if we're going to be a, a, a Christian, we can be in the world but not of the world. 
We are to be in the world. Now, you say, it's difficult for me to do. All I know, this new birth makes us different. We have a new nature. We're no longer a citizen of this world. We're just pilgrims passing through. And if we find ourselves stopping off and, uh, and, uh, and acting like nothing ever happened in the new birth, then, then we are not, we're not practicing the separation that God has for our life. And we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And what it is, you know what it is, as Christians, we have to make a choice. Are we going to try to walk on both sides of the fence? That never ends up well. Are we going to try to put one foot in the world and one foot over here in the church? doesn't work out well. Are we going to try to live one way on Sunday and another way the other days of the week? That's not what God intended. When Jesus brought his salvation, churches weren't even meeting like we're meeting today. Thank God for what we do. But in the New Testament, they met daily and house to house. We know certainly about that. But don't, put, don't wrap it into the paradigm of what we do in serving God. Understand that God's plan for salvation and your eternal redemption, your personal Christian life, is much better than sitting in a pew for two or three hours a week. It has to be more to it. By the way, it's not very, not very satisfying. I often wonder how people can do that and not truly know the Lord because if I didn't know the Lord, the last place I'd want to be is in church. How about you? I guess you're not supposed to say amen right there, but you could say amen right there. If I didn't know the Lord, the last place I'd want to hang out is the church. But I'm afraid that there are many people that don't know the Lord that hang out in the church because they're, maybe they, they're trying to appease a conscience or trying to do what they can. But if we choose something else besides what God has for us in being different from the world, the, we will be unfruitful, number one, as a Christian. We will be miserable. If you find a miserable Christian, they're probably many times they're dealing, struggling with sin. Miserable Christians often are struggling with sin. There's no doubt about it. And I can say amen to that because I've been there. How about you? Amen. Might as well be honest, right? When we're struggling with sin, it's not like we're happy in Jesus. <laughs> it's not like we're excited for, uh, you know, we have trouble opening the Bible because we're afraid what we're going to find there. We have trouble, we have trouble, but someone's going to find out something, whatever the case may be. We are to be in the world. He's praying about their separation. Jesus wants us to be truly like him and not like the world. It's on his prayer list. It's on his prayer list. So the next time we want to drop the guard and the next time we want to enter into something we know doesn't please the Lord, remember, high on Jesus' prayer list is that you and I would not be like the world. He's interested in it. Not just some preacher who wants to make you conform. That's what Jesus is interested in. So when it comes to our personal choices, Jesus is interested in us not being in the world but not of the world. That affects all my personal choices all the way down. How many times has my dad read Romans 12, 1 and 2? If I, I don't think he's read any verses anymore in his life ministry on this earth. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this, what? World. But be ye, what? Transformed by the renewing of your... That's the trouble right there, isn't it? What are we putting into that mind of ours? What are we putting into it? What do I put into it? I have to be careful. I struggle with it. And maybe in no, no, no other age, I don't even have my phone in my pocket, it's laying over there, no other age have things been so visible to our eye gate and ear gate as they are just because of technology. And thank God for the, the use of it. But we have to guard ourselves. I've got to work on it. I've got to work on it. It says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 says, in verse 15, Jesus goes on to talk about this, and he takes a little twist here. He says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. How about that? Jesus doesn't pro pro promise to take our problems away or to take us out of situations. He said, well, that's, that's what Jesus ought to do. I wish he would do that. Well, tell that to the three Hebrew children who went into the fiery furnace. Now, they made it out alive, thank the Lord. But remember that in Daniel chapter 3? It's in verse 17 and 18, they said this. Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going into the fiery furnace. They said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, those are the th maybe the three most powerful words in the Bible. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Think about it in the context of dealing with living in the world and not being of the world. We're going to have to say no 
if we're going to be different than the world. We're going to have to flee if we're going to be different than the world. We cannot warm our hands at the fire of the world and be separate from the world. That doesn't mean we don't love the world. We don't love people who are in the world. We have, we'll get to that in just a moment. But Jesus prepares us to minister to the world by separating us from the world. We cannot minister to the world if we are not separate. You say, well, how's that work? I'm just telling you, if there's not a separation, spiritual separation, we cannot minister to this world. That's why I don't advocate you go down to the bar, have an order of beer, and hand out tracts. <laughs> We're to be separate. I don't recommend you go into the theater and watch an R-rated movie and try to win, and try to invite somebody to church. We're to be separate. I'm amazed at how many Christians watch that filth and then try to live for God. You cannot. So you look, you're angry about it. You're right, I am. We have to say no. We have to say no. And you cannot come into church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night and praise God, hallelujah, and then sit through a filthy movie and be right with God. I'm sorry, it can't happen. can't happen. Or filthy music with inappropriate themes. You cannot, I cannot be right with God and do those things. I can't. And I'm telling you, churches like ours are full of people that are doing things like that all the time, and it is stunting our Christian growth at best. At best. You can't take that in. You can't take that in. Uh, they said, we're not going to do it. We have to say no. Now, I, I'm a, I can be so strong about it in the pulpit, I can tell you, I can struggle with it. I can struggle with it just like anybody else would in this world. There are things my eyes want to see and my ears want to hear. But would God give me the strength to say, no, to be separate? Sometimes I have to get angry about it to do something about it. If you want to be passive about everything in life, you're probably never going to have the strength with God's help to say no to anything. This is not a passive thing that we're doing. We're going to be separate from the world. It's going to take, with God's help and by His Spirit, it's going to take a Holy Spirit grit and determination to be in the world but not to be of the world. And it's, it's a line of demarcation. And you know what it does? It really, it doesn't just divide us from the world. It divides us from other Christians. That's the hard part, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then we have to be careful that we don't look, that we don't sit in judgment and pontificate. But somebody has got to ring, somebody must ring the bell. Somebody must ring the bell. And God help me to be as strong about it when I'm sitting at home with a TV remote in my hand at 11 o'clock at night when everybody else is in bed as I would be right here standing, standing here talking to you right now. Because it's easy right then. Nobody would even know. Those people, the people in my house sleep like a rock. You know, they, they wouldn't even know what I'm doing. And I'm a, I'm a night owl. There's, that's a time of temptation. That's a time of temptation if I'm not careful. Yeah, I've got to be careful. I have to say no. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced a horrible time. And it would be nice if God never let, anything, never let anything come across our path. If nothing ever popped up on my phone, if, if I never got an inappropriate uh, 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 social media friend request, now all those things, if it never happened, that would be great. But you know what? He didn't take Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego out of the fire. He didn't make Nebuchadnezzar disappear. He didn't make the fiery furnace go poof. He didn't beam them up out of the situation. He just was with them through the, he protected them through the fire. But you know what? They, they, they just cleared off the spot. Said, we're not doing it. If it be so, our God's able to deliver us. But if not, we are not going to do this. We're not going to do it. Jesus prays for their separation. Now, again, you can be upset, you can be fussy about it, but if we don't have God's help, we'll struggle, won't we? I, I can testify. Without, God's, without yielding to God's help, I will struggle. I will struggle. You will struggle. And Joseph had that struggle, didn't he? We could talk about this all night. How about Joseph? Young, good-looking fellow brought into Egypt, brought right there in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife sure noticed that, and she, she, she made advances toward him. It would have been very easy for him to go along with all of that. Very easy. But he, he got out of there. He fled from there. I won't take the time to read Genesis 39. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture. But the answer is not getting away from the world, but the, it's getting away from the evil of the world. 
getting away from the evil of the world. And may God help us. Jesus prayed for our separation. And you know what? We have, we have to think about that. We think about not, it's not just getting away from the world. It's getting away from the evil of the world. That's why Jesus moves into this next part. Number two, he prays for our sanctification. Separation really, in a, in a sense, even though it begins internally, we look at the externals, don't we? used to be we look how long somebody's hair is. Uh, we we look, look at certain things about them, and some of those things are still very appropriate. I think a man ought to look like a man, and a lady ought to look like a lady. I know it's 2018, but I haven't changed my mind about that. I don't think God has. Now, we've got to be careful not to enforce our every, 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 dot every I and cross every T exactly what we said it has to be. You know where you have the most control about that is in your own home. Where I have the most influence about that is my own home. We have we give we give we give uh, we we have an institution here in our church, an organism, and we do certain activities. We ask our young people to dress a certain way. They ought to abide by that. Mom and Dad, you ought to encourage them to abide by that because there's a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ in this church. If you want to do something in your home, that's fine. But when we're doing something in the ministries of this church. We ought to think about who we're representing. And when we don't, I'll ask him why we're not doing it. I will. And so I'm not trying to be mean about it, but I'm trying to represent the Lord. See, we have a high calling. And we don't have to be angry or anxious. We can have a lot of fun and serve the Lord. But we look at the outward, the outward appearance. God looks on the heart definitely. But if something's happening on the inside, we'll notice something on the outside. Jesus prays for their sanctification. Sanctification really helps point me to the inner man. Now he prays, he says, sanctify them through thy truth, verse 17. Thy word is truth. Thank, sanctify them through thy truth. We see here this word sanctification. That means you've been purified. Thank God that's what happened in my salvation. I was purified. How about you? Now that's, that's amazing for me to think about. And I won't, I won't get off to talk about that right now, but just stop for a moment to think that your record is completely clean. I think we sang the old account was settled long ago. Was that Sunday evening? And we sang that third verse. When at the judgment bar, I stand before the king. I can't remember the words. The, the, the books will be open. And I'll have a clean record. I don't know exactly what that will be like when I stand before the Lord, but my record is clean. And sanctify thee through thy truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Being purified. Being purified. In the sense of what we're talking about, being purified and set apart for God's service. That's what it means to be sanctified. Set apart for God's service. When something's sanctified, it's made holy. Sanctification takes place, by the way, through the ministry of God's word. The Bible says there in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, it picks up in the middle of the, what's going on there. It says, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy law. And so... We can, again, we can, we can do what I'm doing. You can get up and say, well, we ought to have certain standards and do things a certain way. And I believe in, in, in being appropriate and having grace. And I believe in helping people come along and all those kind of things. I don't believe in controlling anybody's life. But one thing I want to know, I understand is this. I don't want to make anybody conform outwardly. I want to see God transform them inwardly. Yeah, I really, that's, what we're, that's, what the, that's what the mission is, isn't it? That's what the mission is. And the washing of the water of the word. And so sanctification, God's word. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So if we want that, we want to see someone cleansed, made right, and getting things right in their life, the, the things that need to come out going out, and the things that need to come in coming in, you know what the, the way to do that is? Through the Bible. The Bible. As much Bible as we can get to someone, as much Bible as we can get to ourselves. And we spend time in the word of God. It exposes areas of our life that need attention, by the way. We look into the mirror of the Word of God. We see our inequities. We hear the Word of God and fashion our life after its teachings. We become cleaner spiritually and greater of greater use to our Master. So we're not wasting our time by preaching the Bible. We're not wasting our time by reading the Bible. It all leads and lends to our sanctification. We can't have sanctification without the Bible. We can, we can practice things exter externally, like I just said a moment ago. Those externals, but they ought to grow out of God's word and what he does in our heart. Jesus asked God to sanctify these disciples in truth. Because the truth will bring about their sanctification. It will bring about their desire to follow God. It will separate them from sinful people. You know what separates us really? It's not the clothes we wear. It's not necessarily the things we say or we don't say. Those things all grow out of the presence of Almighty God. What separates me from the world and really what separates you from the world is the presence of Jesus Christ. 
It's the presence of Jesus Christ. If we truly have his presence, I believe God is working in us is going to, is going to, is just going to grow us. He will do his withering work in our life. I've, I've tried to express this before. There are things that I may have even listened to on the radio years ago. I don't even listen to the radio hardly anymore. But uh, the, the, I may have listened to something on the radio that was I don't think was pleasing to the Lord. I had an appetite for it. But as the Lord got to be able to possess more of me, as I allowed him to have more of me in my life, next thing I knew, I, didn't have, I just didn't have it. I didn't even think about those, some of those things. Now, I have nowhere reached sinless perfection. Don't get me wrong. I'll have to live a million years to like to touch the hem of the garment, right? But you, do you understand what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit doesn't just produce fruit. I was taught this. Uh, Pastor Sexton taught me this, and it really was an eye-opening thing when I was in seminary. The Holy Spirit does a withering work. And so he puts to death the things in my life that don't please God. Now, there's an interesting symbiosis that takes place when I make these determinations to say no and to live for God. But it's the Holy Spirit that withers things in my life that don't please the Lord as I allow him to flow in and through me. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? And we need to just, just give ourselves to God's word, and it will separate us. He will separate us. We can pursue righteousness, or we can let his righteousness flow through us. And may God help us to have it as our D.L. Moody wrote it in his Bible. I think a lot of people have said this, that the book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from the book. And so if we get in the book, it will help us with our sin problem. Does anybody else here have a sin problem besides me? We all do. We need more of the Bible. I'm still trying to read my five psalms every morning and read my one proverb. And I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do right now is find one verse that really drives something home for me. Now, what I'm doing right now is I'll post that on social media. I just take that verse. I say, that's, that's, my, that's my verse this morning. That's my verse. And I'll post it. To every place I can think, maybe it'll help somebody else today. I don't know. But I know that verse is the one that's got the little, it's got the lights flashing around it today. <laughs> that's the one I need to read. That's the one that reminds me about who God is. Listen, Jesus wants us to be separate. He's praying for that. He didn't save you so you wouldn't be changed. He changed, he saved you to change you. And you know what that is? It's, we, see the, we think about the external in separation, but he does it in an internal way in our sanctification as his word works in us. And the last thing I want to notice here is we need to finish up for this time so much more in this chapter. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. I'm sharing so many thoughts. I'm sure you're wondering where you're at and what's happened here tonight. If I had all these words on these pages, I'd have many more notes. But God prompts me about some things. I'm trying to obey the Lord. He, Jesus doesn't just pray for their separation, their sanctification. He prays for their sending because he's planning to send them out. Why is he worried about their separation? Why is he worried about their sanctification? Because he just wants them to be a certain way? No. Not just that. He wants them to be that way, certainly. But he, he was trying to put all these things into their arsenal so that they would be ready to be sent out. He says here in verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. The purpose of our separation and sanctification is for our sending. It's God's preparation to use us for his glory. To enable us to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To do the work that he's called us to do, as we've heard in the last few weeks, to finish and do the mission that he's called us to. To have a mission accomplished epitaph on our grave marker. We have separation and sanctification so we can be sent out and complete the mission. They would be commissioned. They'd be empowered to accomplish God's work in the world. They would go out by Jesus' authority and they would complete their task that he had given them. It would, they, would, they would do it by being separated from the world while they're in the world. They would do it by being sanctified by God Almighty and his word. And listen, God has a plan. He's appointed you and me. We are the church. We're Calvary Baptist Church. God's plan, he doesn't have a plan B, he doesn't have a plan C. He wants to reach the world and spread his message through us. Therefore, he separates us. Therefore, he sanctifies us so that he can send us. You know, if you're like just everybody else at the workplace, you're not going to have an opportunity to speak much for the Lord. If I'm like everybody else, say, when we're at, the, we're at the ball practice and, and the kids are out there playing, I'm just like every other dad. I'm not going to be able to reach them. Now, God can do anything he wants. So you understand, I'm not talking about I've got to show up with, with my new Bible under my arm. I'm having a fun time carrying my brand new Bible. I've got to take this to soccer practice and hold it up here so somebody will ask me about it. Like, you, you really are different, yes. Maybe we should do more of it. I don't know. 
You know, I, I'm all for people taking their Bible lots of places. I love to take, when I visit the hospitals, I love to take my Bible into a hospital. It gets people's attention. It doesn't even matter how big the Bible is. It doesn't have to be this big. It could be about a third this size. If you just put one here, and I carry it like this, usually. But every, I, to, a, to a person, people go, they're always looking at that Bible. They're always looking at that Bible. Nothing wrong with carrying it. So I'm not trying to disparage that, but I'm talking about if, if we're just like everybody else, what message do we have? Now, I'm not talking about a forced difference. I'm talking about the presence of Jesus. So it takes a lot of grace, doesn't it, when somebody cuts you off in traffic? Not to behave like the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, when, you, when you're trying to get ready in the morning and nothing's going right, not to try to behave like the rest of the world. Right? And when you're late getting to church on a Wednesday night, not to talk like the rest of the world. Not to think like the rest of the world. Whatever the case may be, I'm just revealing some of my own shortcomings right there. It's personal confession. God doesn't have a plan B. It's you and me. That's why he separates us. That's why he sanctifies us. Listen, now God's purpose is not going to be thwarted just because you and I choose to live for ourselves. This is the problem. We can either get in on what God wants to get done in this world and be blessed, or we can choose to live for ourselves and be worldly. If there's such a thing as a worldly Christian, I wonder if there even is. But if there's such a thing, we could do that and then miss out completely on all God's blessings. Miss out on our purpose, you know, and, and hope that when we, you know, I don't know if this is even appropriate to say, when we get to heaven, we can pull out our fire insurance card. Say, so here, will, will you take this? Now, we're saved by grace through faith. But that sounds like what we're doing. Just trying to find, get, buy some fire insurance. Eternal fire insurance. No, no, I don't, I don't think Brother Jim can sell that to you. Can't sell it to you. God's not selling that either. His purpose is not going to be thwarted, but what, what the pro, we have to decide whether we're going to get in on his work that he has. That means we, if we're separated and sanctified, we can be sent. If we're not going to be separated, we're not going to be sanctified, we won't be sent. We won't be able to do the mission. And then we'll get there and it'll be whatever we have will be wood, hay, and stubble. Before the Lord. So our separation, sanctification is connected to our mission. We can't mix all the world in and then stand before the Lord and say, Hope to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so he says, you're separated, you're sanctified, so I can send you. And he said, well, why, why do I have to stay here? I can hardly win these battles. I feel like I'll lose more of them than I'll win. Anybody else feel like that? Your pastor does. I got to lose more of them. I want to say, Lord, if you just take me to heaven, we'd all, you'd be happier and I'd be happier too. Yeah. Probably a lot of people in the world may be happy with that. I don't know, but we'd, we'd all be happy. I wouldn't have to worry about sin anymore, but Jesus says, I've got a mission. There's more people need to hear this message. And Greg, I'm going to keep working on separating you. I'm going to keep working on sanctifying you so I can keep sending you, buddy. So I can keep sending you with this message. I'm glad he's still working. And we have, we have a work to do. And it's our business to get the message out. This story kind of goes with this point, And I'll finish right here and we'll get ready to pray. There's a story told of a beautiful, gorgeously dressed and arrayed woman sitting before a social event in a swanky hotel in a big city. And she was seated there waiting for her husband. And a man sat down beside her and began to witness to her about Jesus Christ, to this beautiful woman, this socialite. Uh, he was telling her all about the love of Jesus and the grace of God. And when her husband came, uh, her and her husband left, and they decided they'd go back up to the hotel room before they went to their social, social event. And finally her husband said to her, Honey, what is the matter with you? What has happened to you? And she said, Husband, I, I really don't know how to reply, but while I was down there in the lobby, that fellow was talking to me. He sat down beside me. He talked to me about my soul. He talked to me about my relationship with God. And the husband angrily replied, well, why didn't you just tell him that's none of his business? Your soul and your relationship to God is your problem, not his. And the wife replied, husband, had you seen his face and you'd heard the tone of his voice, you'd have thought it was some of his business. He'd been sent. He'd been sent. But you and I aren't going to be sent the way God intended if we don't allow him to separate us and to sanctify us. Then he can send us. And if we're not sent then we've missed the mission, right? And so 
You might be like me and say, well, Lord, there's some things I'd like you not to cut out of my life. Some things I'm, I kind of enjoy. And by the way, there is pleasure in sin, right? For a season, at least. We pray for a long, we want a long season. But it's a season. Seasons come and go. We say, Lord, I, I don't really want to, I want to drop this. You know, it doesn't have to be, we don't have to be talking about things like murder and adultery, friends. I'm not talking, I mean, even those things could be, they could be in a group like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. The seed to all those sins lie inside of us. They're inside of me. All of them. But it's the things, anything, all sin is against God. It's anything that comes between us and then it gets us. We're not separated. We're not sanctified. We can't be sent. And then we're just floundering around trying to figure out why we're even here. Let God have his way in our life. If he starts talking about getting something out, listen to the Lord, even though it's painful. Sometimes that kind of surgery, there's not enough anesthetic in the world for it, right? Let him get it out of there. Let him get it out of there. He's sanctifying us. He's preparing us so he can use us. He can use us. And may God help us. I've explained it over and over, but God will help us to understand better than I can and really to want it. And I know this is where I'm living. It's where I'm living. You know, I, I could go on and on, but let me just say this. Sometimes they're just, I let things frustrate me, and it weakens me, and I'm so easy for the devil. How about you? I get aggravated with something or someone, and then the devil, he's, he's right there. Just like, just like with Cain, sin lieth at the door. And the, the devil's not completely omniscient, but he seems to know where to show up, doesn't he? So when I, I get frustrated, I get upset, or I get down, here we are. If I give in to that thing, the separation's not working, the sanctification's not working, and then my mission is put on pause. And if I'm not careful, it'll be obliterated if I get too far off the rails. God help us to let Jesus, he's praying for this. He's praying for it. Let's pray. God will help us to yield to it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this truth and the patient people who are listening to me as I express my heart. And dear God, I pray you'd help me. I don't know what it is about talking about this chapter and speaking about it, but my heart gets so pierced. Uh, dear God, I pray you'd help us to be yielding to your separation in our life, Lord, to your sanctification, Lord, so we can do the mission, so we can be sent. And Lord, I pray that this group here, this is not all of our church, but it's the heart of our church. This is the heart right here. And Lord, I pray that we would get really get saturated with your truth. Help us to do where we get it. Lord, I get excited about five psalms a day and a proverb a day. And Lord, I don't want to belittle that. But Lord, help us to take in as much truth from your word as we can. And Lord, may I have a sanctifying, separating work in our life so that we can be sent by you. And may it come so naturally to us. It's not natural when we're living in the flesh. It's not natural when we're living like the world. May it come so naturally to me to be a witness for you and to do the mission because of the separating and sanctifying you're doing in my life. I pray it for our friends tonight. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And if you're praying for God to help you to be separated and sanctified for the sake of the mission, would you say amen? amen. And uh, God help us. It's bigger than either one, either one of us. It's bigger than our church. But together, we have this mission together in our, in our county, in our, in our area. We'll leave out of here, and tomorrow morning, we'll go all over Hampton Roads, won't we? And may God help us. Father, help us to go with your light and a yieldedness to your word and what you're doing in our life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. We'll go to our prayer sheet here tonight. And... Um, much to pray over. Does everybody have a copy? I know we handed those out a little bit earlier. If you'll move toward a prayer partner, we try to have folks praying together and try to have nobody praying alone unless that's just their wish. But it's the biblical principles we try to agree together in prayer. But uh, let's work together to move together. If anybody would like a prayer partner and they don't have one, you could raise your hand and we could ask somebody to be kind enough to pray with you.